Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Let's Talk Donation with Gift of Hope. I am your host, Olivia Fox, and we are so excited to have you here again for another week. Um, this is an interactive call-in show where you can call in and ask myself and any of my expert guests that I have each week featured any questions that you might have about organ and tissue donation. We're also streaming live at cantv.org slash hotline. That's forward slash hotline. Again, that's cantv.org forward slash hotline if you're viewing with us streaming live. And you can call in and uh, ask us any questions at 312 738 1060. It's right on the bottom of your screen. Again, it's 312 738 1060. So we're so excited to have another opportunity to talk about the importance of organ and tissue donation in our community. And tonight I'm so excited to show you guys a feature in which Gift of Hope uh, is represented. This is actually my, myself and my mother. We have it on our overhead as well. And this is the Homewood Flossmore Chronicle. So um, it's a, a free newspaper in the South Suburban area um, in which they wanted to feature a story about my mom's one-year anniversary, which is here in November. So we're so grateful and so thankful this Thanksgiving to celebrate this blessing that my family has received. And we're also really grateful to the Home of Flossmore Chronicle for sharing this story because, um, as we know, sharing any story of donation really, really definitely makes a difference in the community. So uh, we're always pleased to share our personal story. And I'm so excited to invite my introduce my guest um, for tonight. And I'm not even actually going to call her a guest. I'm going to call her my um, featured co-host that I have invited again this evening. Um, and it is my mom, Miss Monica Fox. So, hey, Mom. Hey, Ruby. Thanks for being back again. Thanks for inviting me. We got really good feedback on the first show in which we talked about your story. Um, and we're here this week just to talk a little bit more about that idea of directed donation, which is how you were blessed and how our family was blessed um, with your kidney donation and with your kidney transplant that you received a year ago this month. It is crazy to think about that. Yes, it's been a year. It, it has been such an a awesome blessing. year, such a blessing. Um, so we're really excited to have you here tonight. And I'm actually going to start off this show um, with showing a little post clip uh, from my mom's transplant. So uh, last time you guys, last time my mom was with us and you guys watched, um, we showed the video of her waiting and talking about that campaign in which, um, you know, we wait every day. Everybody waits for something, but you never think that you're going to be on a list waiting for something that will save your life before your life is ended. Um, so, so I want to take this time to show you guys this video um, produced by Gift of Hope uh, and DD Productions. We are, let's take a look at this. You kid me. Everything went perfectly, absolutely perfectly from start to finish. My, I was in surgery all night from midnight until about 5 a.m. And when I woke up at 11 and they finally took the tube out, the breathing tube, I felt 200% better than ever before. Well, that gives the whole meaning of our work. Uh, having a patient who recovers uh, so well after surgery and looks so happy, uh, it's uh, basically, it cannot uh, explain in any way the feeling that gives to the surgeon and to the doctor. Of course, uh, she was pretty straightforward case. I'm particularly happy she got it because she's an advocate for organ donation and she got uh, some return from her passion for the field. There's not a word to explain really how I feel. It's just I feel like I'm going to explode. I'm so excited and I feel so well. And I don't feel like I just had major surgery. That's nobody but God. Nobody but God. And I'm just so grateful. The other, the other thing to note is that because they designated their donation, that's important for everybody to know. If you are in the midst of a trauma, you can say who you want your loved one's organs to go to. That's important to know. And they were so gracious to tell me how much peace and joy it has given them to know that Milton saved my life and that I am doing well and that I'm doing good in the community and I won't stop until those 5,000 people who are waiting on the list for five to seven years in Illinois are no longer waiting. Monica has never met Milton's family before. 
the family who gave uh, the organ donation to her. And they traveled here from Tennessee to be in this service so that they could meet Monica. Go on and hug each and every one of them because you're hugging a part of Milton as you hug her. So that was just a little taste of um, an awesome uh, post-transplant video that Gift of Hope did um, to continue to tell my mom's story and to share um, the good news about how this process works and the importance of really sharing your story because that's really how the story of directed donation happened is is that you shared your story everywhere um, thanks to the platform that Gift of Hope gave you and when someone was in that position they thought about you and they thought about reaching out to you and and directly saving your life um, through organ and tissue donation. So um, we're grateful to be able to show that video and we're just so grateful to my mom's donor family um, who so so selflessly gave this gift um, to my mom. So um, yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. Such a blessing. Such a blessing to to have received that gift. To have waited um, and waited with hope, thanks to Gift of Hope, I waited with hope. I always say that. Gift of Hope gave me hope. It gave me something to hold on to. Something to do um, that was constructive, that was going to make a difference regarding what I was waiting for. And so raising awareness in this community is what I'm about. And I think that's the mission that God has given to me. In addition, um, now being a post-transplant patient, uh, I've become aware that this is another part of the journey. The journey's not over. Definitely. So the journey um, began with dialysis, and I became a, an expert on dialysis so treatment. Let's, so let's stop right there, because that's a really great point that we want to kind of focus on tonight. So if any of our viewers are on dialysis, have any questions about dialysis, have a loved one on dialysis, are waiting for a transplant, have any questions about the waiting list, please call in and ask us any questions about that because as my mom mentioned, um, she did during that time become an expert in dialysis and I think that's an important thing for us to understand is that you are your best advocate. You are your number one advocate. So you need to make sure you understand everything that's going on with you. Be an absolute compliant patient so that when that gift and the time comes, you are prepared, that your body is prepared to accept that gift and to really take the second chance at life. So um, please feel free to call in and ask us any questions that you might have about dialysis um, or the waiting list. Um, so can you talk to me a little bit about um, why you felt the need to become an expert um, with dialysis and then with the waiting, with understanding the waiting list and then, you know, even post-transplant. But really just when you were in dialysis, why was that important? And maybe even talking about your background might help, under, might, might help people understand um, how you were able to kind of figure this out. Okay, so my background is I've been a medical administrator for over 25 years and I did a lot of work. Most of my work was around um, dealing with insurance companies, um, contracting with them uh, for the providers and uh, billing and collections. And so I had a real understanding of medical issues mm -hmm. um, with regard to billing and payment and also uh, just by being the family member uh, who was always the, the number one supporter of anyone who was sick or in the hospital oh, yes. um, and interfacing with the doctors in that regard, um, I just became very knowledgeable and I was comfortable with um, talking about medical issues. Right, because I mean at the time of your illness you actually had to leave work. I mean, I don't know if people know or understand, but dialysis, if you're on full-time dialysis, it's a, it's a real commitment. So during that time of your illness you weren't able to work anymore. So you always told me that your health was your job at that time. So Correct. So I was, yes, I wasn't able to work. Dialysis, um, I had to go for four, my treatment time was four hours, three days a week, but that actually takes almost six hours out of your day. Um, 
if you include the commute and the time that you wait to get hooked up and taken off. So it does take a good portion of the day. Um, and when you, and your, your um, energy level is variable with regard to dialysis. So very early on, I realized that I had to learn about the machine and what it was doing to my body mm -hmm. so that I could control the way that I felt when I left there. Right. And I was fortunate enough to um, be able to talk with the technicians who were controlling the machine and they helped me to learn about it as well as my doctor, my nephrologist, um, was very um, instrumental in telling me things that I needed to know about how it affects your body. So it's important pe for people to know that they do have to be their own advocate. You have to speak up about how you feel. You don't have to feel terrible and drained every time you leave dialysis. You can feel, you can have them make some changes to your treatment that will help you to feel better. The other way to control the way you feel is to control what you're putting in your body. Thank you. Thank is, you. That's is, your nutrition. There's a full-time nutritionist on staff at all the dialysis centers and they come around and they talk to you about your lab results and they tell you what you should eat less of and what you should eat more of and that affects um, the way you're able to function because... One thing I remember specifically you had to eat less chocolate. Yes, that sick. was very hard because I love chocolate. <laughs> and but chocolate it has a lot of phosphorus in it. Okay, okay. And your kidney does not process out phosphorus. Well, your kidney processes out processes out phosphorus, but not when it's not working. Okay. And dialysis doesn't process out phosphorus properly, well enough. So you have to limit the amount of phosphorus that you take into your body. Okay. So chocolate was something I had to do without. And uh, I'm glad to say that that's one of the benefits of having a transplant now. I can have chocolate if I'd like. Happy Halloween. I got you an almond <laughs> joy. I'll give it to you later. Thanks. <laughs> so it's just important to know that you have to be your own advocate. And that's not just with dialysis. That's with all health care. And when it all comes down to it, it's all about what we put in our body. Yes. Healthy eating is key. That's what it always comes down to. And so that's important now, post-transplant, healthy eating and um, live, eating um, a heart-healthy diet so that my heart is not having to work too hard to process out all kinds of sodium and things like that. Yeah, so. and I think the nutrition idea is a great um, thing to think about also in, in thinking about combating these things before they even happen, about yes. being proactive um, so that we don't have things like kidney failure and heart disease. Um, you know, just making sure that we're raising our kids with, you know, a nutritious, healthy lifestyle, uh, with organic things and making sure that we're watching our salt and just all the kind of things that we were maybe raised on, reconsidering those and really focusing on more of a healthy lifestyle. And then we would hope that we would be able to prevent people even, you know, having organ failure and needing a transplant. So the nutrition factor is key, um, not only when you're waiting, but even in being proactive about, um, you know, just living a healthy lifestyle. Yes. And it all, it all comes back to, um, you know, there are lots of different illnesses that lead to um, the need for a transplant and organ donation is very necessary. Yes, um, definitely. But healthy lifestyles also help people to be healthier and therefore be able to be donors so that every person is not, every organ is not transplantable because everyone's not healthy enough. Yes. Um, so it all, it all begins with healthy lifestyle. Great. Yeah. So um, now let's talk about you kind of being an expert in understanding the importance of uh, where you were at on the waiting list and um, maybe we can talk a little bit more about the directed donation and how that worked and how it's important for us to understand um, that if we know about these stories in our community, know about the stories of our loved ones, when we do find ourselves in a tragic situation, uh, you know, we can think of those people around us that are in need and think of really be able to understand how to turn tragedies into a triumph 
because at the end of the day, we don't have any say in, in these tragedies right. that happen. And once organ donation becomes a conversation, the tragedy has already happened. So now it's kind of, what now? How do we change this, the end of a terrible, terrible story? And organ and tissue donation and transplantation really is the way to do that. Yes. Yes. So, um... I said understanding, understanding the list and where you, how, how are you listed? Well, the, the, the first thing is that you have to be ready for transplant. So we need to understand that sometimes people don't get a transplant because they're not ready, mm. meaning they're not healthy enough. Mm. So that begins with, um, if you're waiting on a kidney transplant, that begins with not missing your treatments and following the advice of the nutritionist and doing everything that you can do on your part. Um, part of the process of getting on the list to wait for a transplant is getting tested. So you have to have all of your cancer screening tests done. Um, all of your dental testing. Yes, mammogram and pap smear for women, um, colonoscopy. All of these things have to be done so that they know that your body is free and clear of cancer because if you get a transplant and then you are required to take immunosuppressant drugs in order to keep your body from rejecting the organ that you're given. Sure. Um, if there's any cancer brewing in your body, it will come up because your immune system is being suppressed. So it's important to do all that testing, to um, work with the transplant team to get everything in place so that you're ready. Now the wait is five to seven years. Right. While you're waiting, every year you have to keep your tests current. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. a lot of work. It it, it's a lot of appointments, you know. But mm -hmm. you have to, you have to do it, and you have to keep your, you have to keep everything current. I was ready, and therefore, when that call came, I was able to receive that gift. Great. So it looks like we actually got a caller. So go ahead and put them through. Put them through. Hi, um, I was just a little bit curious about which hospitals that I can go to to learn more about being on the list or getting somebody on the transplant list. Great, so that's a, that's a great question. Thanks, um, thanks for that one, caller. Um, so there are nine transplant centers in our service area. Uh, we are actually in the midst of about four of them right now um, in the medical district, uh, but Maybe you can talk a little bit more about that, but it's through a transplant center that you have to get listed in order to be um, ready and waiting. Yes, and it's important, too, to understand that each transplant center has a different personality. They have a different focus. Yes, different um, expertise. Different expertise. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're right here in the medical center, as Olivia said. We're right near Rush University. Uh, we're on the campus of UIC, which is where I received my transplant. You saw in the video um, Dr. Enrico Benedetti and Dr. Evo Svetnoff. They are amazing and awesome. Our angel team. They are the best and they did my surgery. Um, there's also Loyola and Northwestern. Um, University, University of, Chicago. of Chicago, and then there are some in the southern um, or central part of central parts of central Illinois. Um, so there are they are all over the state, but you have to be listed with a transplant center, and that is where you get all the testing done. As my mom mentioned, um, you have to have this testing done. It has to be current every year. So you will be sticking with that one transplant center. Um, there will be a transplant coordinator that you will work with um, all the way through. And that is how you uh, are on the wait list, added to the wait list. Right. And so the wait list um, for kidney transplants is based on time. Um, for other transplants like heart and lung and liver okay. is based on how sick you are. And there are various, various um, levels and measures that they go by. Um, but for kidneys, it's based on time. So... It's a long time to wait, five to seven years, and many people die each day. Thirteen people die waiting for a kidney transplant. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. You don't die from dialysis. Um, most often people die from heart failure, 
because dialysis is very difficult on your heart and it's important to maintain all your appointments with the cardiologist so that your heart is healthy enough to continue to endure the dialysis for the length of your wait. But I would say just it's really important to share your story. There are so many people waiting. I met a young, a young boy, nine years old on Saturday. He was just adorable. And he's on dialysis now. His mother was beautiful. And she's doing peritoneal dialysis at home with him. And nine he's waiting old. for a transplant at nine years old. That shouldn't be. There shouldn't be this wait. We need more people to be registered donors. We need more people to say yes to donation. In a time of a tragedy, when a life is lost, another life can be saved. Someone else can live on if you just say yes to donation. We can't take our organs with us. And something that I, that I often say in the community is that we plan for everything else in our lives. I actually learned this from, from my boss. Uh, we plan for everything else in our lives. We plan to go to work tomorrow, we plan for vacation, we plan for the holidays, we plan for everything. But the only thing that people have the hardest time planning for is our death. And that's the only thing that's promised to everyone here. We don't know that we're going to get up and go to work tomorrow. We don't know that we're going to make it to that next vacation. But if we can plan for our death and what we want to be done, how we want to honor our, the legacy of our lives once it's our time to go, this is really how you do it, through organ and tissue donation. So our call to action this week and every week is for you to go on over to giftofhope.org and register as an organ donor if you have not already at the DMV and on your driver's license. Say yes to organ and tissue donation. It means nothing now. We want you to live a long, healthy life. It's just a little blip on your ID. Um, and you can really leave a legacy on this earth uh, once God chooses that it's your time to go. So if you have not already at the DMV said yes to donation, go on over to giftofhope.org and go to the bottom of our screen, join the registry, and it'll take you 30 seconds. Um, also, if you have any questions for myself or my guest, um, you can email me at ofox at giftofhope.org. Um, I would love to connect you to any resources uh, or any of our guests that you have seen in past um, episodes. We would love to connect you with our organization. Um, Gift of Hope does a really, really awesome job supporting the community um, and really just sharing the message and mission of organ and tissue donation, life-saving and life-enhancing organ and tissue donation. So um, I'm definitely going to get that family, the, the mother and her and her young son, um, as guests hopefully on the show because I would love to share their story. Because um, as we know, the more people that know, the more chance that there is, you know, that we can, we can get some help. So we're definitely going to share that story. And if you are out there, if you are waiting, please, please continue to share your story. Share it on Facebook. Share it on social media. My grandmother used to laugh at my mom how much she shared her story on social media and talked about what she was going through. But it's really a way that we connect in this day and age. And it's okay. It is okay to use your voice and share your story. Someone will help you. Someone will help you. We are a loving community. And, you know, it, your time will come. Your time will definitely come. So keep up the hope. Um, you know, follow that renal diet. Stay on, stay on top of your dialysis, understand your treatment, and continue to tell your story, and your time will come. So um, I just want to say that Thanksgiving Day is my actual kidney anniversary, and I just want everybody to know how grateful I am, and to think of me. We'll all be celebrating on Thanksgiving Day. Just think of me for a few minutes and know how grateful I am for the gift that I received. Thank you, Milton. We love Thanks. you. Thanks. Milton is my hero. Milton is our hero, and we love his family, and yes. we're so excited to celebrate this month. So if you are in the South Suburban area, grab the Homewood Flossmore Chronicle, read our story, share our story, share your story, and um, register as an organ donor if you have not already. So we'll see you guys next week on Let's Talk Donation with Gift of Hope. Thanks for tuning in, guys, and thanks, Mom, for being my co-host. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Have a good one, everyone.